Welcome to the SPAC Alpha web series. My name is Dan Dombrowski, and this is where I'd introduce the SPAC Target and their merger partner, but we want to take a more holistic view of what's going on with the entirety of the SPAC space. So I asked Jeff Paul and Brian Riley from BMO Capital Markets to come on and talk to me about what it is that they're seeing within the SPAC space and how are their conversations unfolding with clients. So with that, thank you both for taking the time to speak with me today. Happy to be here. Jeff, could you give me some background on how you found your way into SPACs? Um, I've been a capital markets focused investment banker for the last 22 years, um, covering a number of different sectors, uh, including energy and natural resources over that time, um, and joined BMO uh, a few months ago to really help uh, build out the SPAC business uh, at the firm. Um, have been involved in SPACs for the last few years, both from a sell side advisory perspective as well as a capital markets advisory standpoint um, and uh, you know think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for this market to continue to mature and grow uh, over the course of the next few years. So similar to Jeff, I'm a long-term capital markets uh, banker. I've been doing this for 16 years. The, the core of that experience has been an equity linked to capital markets, so convertibles and equity derivatives. And you know a little less than a year ago, um, you know, joined your BMO SPAC effort and kind of took responsibility for the SPAC capital markets business, partnering with with Jeff and a few other members of the team who are more responsible for the SPAC advisory business and trying to provide kind of full service, um, full service for all of our clients, both on the on the on the sponsor side, you know, bring them from the IPO phase all the way through completion of the transaction and each you know, having be able to hold their hand each level, each component of the transaction. But also, um, our, you know, the target companies at the end of the day, working with the most significant um, base of private company clients and bringing them to and affording them an opportunity to review and analyze kind of the SPAC path as a way to monetize um, in, lieu of, in lieu of either traditional IPO or, or, or M&A. So i um, excited to be, be a part of the team and, and kind of build the, uh, help build the market over the coming years. What was your initial introduction to the SPAC space? Uh, so BMO had a, a, a team in place that was hidden, spoke, focusing on the SPAC market, relatively junior team. So I helped them in a variety of capacities around, around structure, obviously looking at, uh, looking at the warrants themselves. Um, and then we started to have a few transactions in which there was a lot of overlap between the investor base that I deal with on a regular basis from my equity linked background. Um, and that kind of brought me into the, the SPAC landscape, kind of the, the investor overlap between the, the technical players in the convertible market and the technical players in the SPAC market. There's a lot of overlap there and kind of common relationships. Um, you help get me uh, involved in, in, in the SPAC world. You know, I came around uh, to the market a little bit from a different perspective. You know, my prior firm, I was doing a number of uh, equity private placements and um, sell side advisory work and, you know, really saw a transition of or kind of a melding of the private capital markets into the public capital markets with the evolution of the SPAC product um, and uh, worked on one of the early earlier uh, in this latest uh, flurry of activity SPACs. Um, advising a company called Hylion, which does electrification in the um, uh, long haul trucking space. And, you know, we had originally started out with a, an equity private placement for the company and ultimately found a SPAC transaction for them that, you know, raised significantly more capital at a significantly higher valuation than we've been targeting in the private markets. And, you know, saw that as kind of the, the uh, foray of, of SPACs starting and, you um, Worked on a number of transactions since then, and then ultimately joined the BMO team uh, a couple of months ago to you know, refocus in on you know more of a pure capital markets oriented uh, approach to the market. Can you walk me through how these transactions are actually coming together, or how that's evolved over the, uh, the past year or two? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's interesting um, the the type of deals that are getting done, or or the type of deals that investors are wanting to see in the market, um, really from two years ago to twelve months ago to today. Um, you know, two years ago, when uh, you know when Hylion and some of the earlier uh, transactions in this latest wave were happening, I think there was clearly a an idea that investors were going to be able to were willing to and interested in providing meaningful capital to businesses that had big hopes and dreams, and you know to some degree moonshot oriented business plans. 
Um, and you know, that was a great fit for a number of sectors, energy transition and kind of the EV space in particular, where you know, the SPAC ability to go to market with long range projections, tell a story about your company and your business plan, your ability to execute on that plan um, with an infusion of a meaningful amount of capital, you know, that's really kind of what some of the earlier transactions were and, and got a lot of the excitement investors you know, wanted to own the next Tesla and there weren't a lot of options in public markets and SPACs were a quick way to get those kind of deals into the market um, on attractive terms for you know, really all parties at the time. And I'd say as the market has grown dramatically and evolved over the course of the, you know, the last 24 months, you've seen investors much more focused on more mature businesses um, with real cash flows that are uh, you know, more tangible can be valued on, you know, a next year or two years out basis, as opposed to looking five or seven years out to, uh, to value a company. And how have these structures evolved over that time? Um, you know, I'd say there, there, there's really kind of two things. One, there's the upfront SPAC market, right? And I think that's seen a pretty heavy evolution over the course of the last 24 months as well in structure. Um, you know, I think a year ago uh, in the, you know, the first quarter of last year when the market was, ripping and, and, you know, really tremendous volumes of deals were getting done and investors were, were backing all kinds of different teams. Um, you know, you saw SPACs putting out deals where, um, you know, very limited warrant coverage, 24 month terms um, and large SPAC vehicles being created. Uh, I think if you looked at the fourth quarter of last year, the market had changed quite a bit to, you know, all the SPACs that were coming to market were overfunded trusts. So, you know, sponsor teams putting incremental capital into the deals. They were virtually all half warranted deals and they were shorter term. So rather than having a 24 month term to go out and find a deal, you know, they were really kind of down to 15 to 18 months. So, you know, that's kind of the front end. You know, on the back end, I would say um, deals were getting done uh, with very large pipe transactions and a lot of enthusiasm around them a year ago. Uh, when that front end market was also much more open and investors were seeing, you know, very strong price performance on the back end of deals. You saw, you know, deals getting done, relatively high valuations. A lot of them had meaningful incremental capital coming alongside them in the term, you know, in the form of common equity pipes that were three, four, five hundred million dollar plus in size. And so you had um, larger SPACs uh, with most of the SPAC capital actually going into the deal also raising large pipe transactions and, you know, putting very large quantums of capital behind some of these companies. Um, you know, over the second half of, of 2021, the market got a lot more challenging. The pipe market uh, in particular became more challenged. And so while many deals continue to have pipe transactions associated with them to bring in incremental capital to the company, um, you know, the average size of pipes got much smaller from, you know, the three, four, five million dollar plus pipes uh, virtually disappeared and you saw a lot of you know, pipes in the one to $200 million range and redemptions became more of an issue for transactions as well. So, you know, the expectation that if you had a $300 million SPAC, you'd have $300 million in cash at the end of the day, um, 12 months ago, really today, that's been much more variable. And you've seen, you know, on average, something like 75% of shares get redeemed on these transactions in, in the fourth quarter of last year. So, much less money um, ultimately getting into the transactions on deals that have closed recently, both due to smaller pipes and you know higher redemption levels. And I think adding on there, Jeff, all perfect points. The, the, the one addendum to it is we've seen the investor base evolve as well. And, and I'm, I'm thinking more on the DSPAC side in the pipe market. You go back to your comments in the first quarter of last year, where we were seeing pipes of significant size on virtually every single, you know, DSPAC transaction. Now, as the, as the, and those deals were being supported by fundamental sector-driven investors, you know, the Black Rocks, Fidelity, Wellingtons of the world were stepping in and being the anchors of, of those pipe transactions. As the pipe market further deteriorated, as, you know, just, the onslaught of supply did not slow down. You saw though that investor base really entrench and become much, much more selective as they had just a plethora of opportunities to choose from. Um, they could they could be more selective. As the the we went over the course of the year, now as Jeff's highlighted, you know, the average or you know, median deal size for a pipe in the fourth quarter is gonna be less than $100 million. So it's drastically different from what we're seeing in the first quarter of the year. The typical buyer in the fourth quarter has also changed. Now we're looking at the SPAC sponsor themselves, 
uh, existing shareholders of the target business and or strategics really being the drivers of, of demand, the anchors behind the pipe transactions that are, that are getting done. And we're seeing, while well, still the vast majority of deals getting done with uh, pipes, it's, it is a lower number than it was certainly at the beginning of the year. So there's been an, a, a, the investor base here has evolved as well. And that's playing into the post announcement world, world too, where in the first quarter of 2021, certainly the first month and a half of 2021, where the deals were working, deals were getting announced, you'd see the pop, you would see a, a rotation of the shareholder base away from some of the more technical driven you know, SPAC IPO players into fundamental investors, retail. Um, now in the fourth quarter, where the asset class has gotten, uh, has come under pressure over the co course of the year, as have all the higher growth asset classes, you know, regular way IPOs in the same boat, you're, we're not seeing the, the pops post announcement. And it has been very challenging for many of the, the, the deals that are out there to see that successful rotation of the shareholder base, which is why we're seeing these you know, redemption levels meaningfully spike here in, in the, the, the latter half of the year. Now, you're talking about uh, higher redemptions. How are transactions coming together to, to combat this? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I, I, think, I think structures has been a key component of the deals that have successfully closed here at the the fourth quarter and will be critical to the success of transactions moving here in, in 2022. And what I mean by that is the, the SPAC sponsors themselves utilizing structure, utilizing their own economics and, and distribution of those economics to holders of, of the SPAC, to targeted investors stepping in, whether in the form of non-redemption agreements, backstops, to ensure that they're able to deliver the minimum cash threshold to the target company for a successful business combination. That has spiked significantly from where we were certainly the early in 2021, we didn't see those types of, um, uh, of structures regularly at all. And now it's become commonplace uh, to get deals over the finish line. Um, and I think we're gonna see more structure. Structure is going to evolve. It's going to evolve in the pipe market. It's also going to evolve on the back end. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things being discussed with from people like Jeff and I um, with sponsors, with target businesses, ways they can navigate the challenges of the pipe market and ways they can navigate the limited bid we're seeing currently from the fundamental investor base for the vast majority of the, uh, the SPACs that get, the D SPACs that get announced. And what sort of structure is actually working? I do think we're seeing a lot of non-redemption agreements out there. There's been a lot of uh, backstops. Um, th those structures are, are, are key, I think, to providing confidence, both the sponsor and the target, that there is going to be the capital there going through um, you know, the redemption date and getting into the, getting into the closing period. I think we're going to see you know, in, in the pipe market, if you want to pivot there for a second, I think we're going to see more structure there. I think we'll see a lot more deals come in, you know, in downside protected form. You know, the, the easiest, cleanest way to go there is, you know, the convertible route or debt structures. Um, I think we're going to see a rise there as it, it's going to allow the, the SPACs and the target companies to access a new pool of investors. There's a lot of money or on the sidelines looking at has been looking at the SPAC market for a while now looking for an entry point and the vast majority of deals either a have been too much of the the moonshot businesses where it really couldn't support debt uh, or incremental leverage uh, or the, the the teams involved you know you felt as though they had another alternative and just a traditional common equity pipe route which they they've not gone down the, the, the convertible debt or debt path uh, on the pipe side. I think we're going to see more teams look to take advantage of the capital that's out there and, and, and really hoping to get more involved in the SPAC space through debt structures. Um, other ways you can provide downside protection to investors, I think it will become more common here in, in 2022, or you know, one, one, one alternative is what I call flexible commitment where investors have, um, they commit to provide an amount of capital into the deal and they can satisfy that commitment either by funding a pipe, uh, at $10 purchase price. Uh, you would do that obviously if the stock, if the post announcement, the stock trades up, investors are just gonna fund the pipe. 
or they could fund their commitment by purchasing shares in the open market before the redemption date. Um, so ultimately, the, the, the target business, the SPAC, they're going to receive a fixed amount of capital, but the investor has flexibility in how they deliver that commitment. Um, it is not going to allow the SPACs or the target businesses to maximize the capital they take out of the transaction as the size of the pipe could go down if the stock doesn't appreciate uh, post-announcement. But it, it does give investors um, you know, more optionality. Um, and it, that is something I think all the investors that are out there looking at the market are going to, to value and, and, and appreciate. Um, we're seeing some a little more structure in the FPA land. Um, and it's a little bit different than the, the FPA you, you, that in the SPAC world, the FPA parlance we're using the SPAC world. It's more, I would view it almost as like a pseudo ATM where uh, effectively the, the transaction is the company, the target company will agree to buy back shares down the road. You think one year, six months down the road from the investor, they'll put money into an escrow account to fund on that purchase. And then the investor controls both the shares that they own today, but also that escrow account. And they can make a determination on, on obviously given the trading in the stock, the stock, um, you know, trades up, they'll just simply sell, the, the, you know, they'll sell those shares. Um, but if the stock is, is trading down, they'll hold on to the shares and utilize the, the cash in the escrow account. So I think we're going to see a lot more structure like this. Uh, as we roll through the new year to navigate some of the challenges around the pipe market and deliver, allow the SPACs to be able to deliver kind of that minimum cash threshold. Now, how are discussions evolving for anchor investors? We're seeing less and less, I don't want to say conviction, but less and less deals get supported by fundamental investors, the Black Rocks, Fidelities, you know, Wellingtons of the world. They're still playing in the pipe market, but they're being very, very selective. So the trend we've seen, I think this is one that will likely continue, uh, is the anchor of the majority of these SPACs is, in many cases, the sponsor behind the SPAC. Um, the shareholders, existing shareholders of the target company who are, who are doubling down on their investment uh, and or strategics who are around the situation and, and you know, looking to put capital work to, to strengthen their relationship with the target business. So can you lay out the bull and bear case for going forward? Listen, I, I think there is, um, you know, the SPAC markets evolved a lot over just the last two years, and it's been a market that's been around a lot longer than that, right? But I think what you've seen is a real uh, increase in participation in the market from larger institutional players, uh, you know, some would say kind of more blue chip sponsors, some of the large finance, you know, financial sponsors like, like an Apollo, a KKR, they've gotten behind SPAC vehicles and, and put them in the market. Um, I think, you know, it's clear that the SPAC market is going to continue um, forward in, in a more significant way than it has in the past. Um, you know, I think that the real question for the market is how does it, uh, you know, kind of sort out quality and encourage participation from broader market participation, you know, broader market participation than, than, you know, as Brian was talking about, has been the case over the last couple of quarters. Um, you know, how do you get the Fidelities and Black Rocks and Wellingtons and T. Rose to want to come back into the market? And I think the, the bull case is you see a real high grading of the opportunities that are brought to the SPAC market. Um, you know, I think when we talk to investors around you know, what they want to see in DSPAC transactions. Um, you know, there's a focus on a, on a couple of things. Um, and I think quality is, 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 you know, kind of towards the top of that list, right? Quality, both in terms of the management teams, as well as the companies and businesses that are coming public through the SPAC form. And, and as you see more companies with real kind of ready for prime time management teams running real businesses that are generating real cash flow come to the market, you know, the, the perceived quality of SPAC transactions will continue to get higher. Um, I think what we want to move away from is just being the moonshot type of deals that you know maybe weren't quote unquote IPOable two years ago to you know real quality businesses coming public today. Um, you know, given the market backdrop, clearly you know valuation is pretty critical as well. Um, valuation is always something that you have to figure out whether it's in the IPO market or or in the SPAC market. And there's a balance between you know setting an evaluation that's attractive enough to draw 
you know, high quality institutional investors without kind of undervaluing the business or taking on too much dilution if you're the company or the sponsor. But I think if you can put appropriate valuations on truly high quality businesses um, and get investors to believe that you're going to see better performance in the back end, um, you know, I think part of the market too is you know, finding unique opportunities for investors. You know, that's why investors were excited about SPACs two years ago and the opportunities that were coming. It was, there was a real uniqueness or scarcity value to some of those businesses. Um, and, you know, frankly, some of the scarcity value around an EV company uh, that existed two years ago doesn't exist today because of the SPAC market and so many deals that have gotten done. Uh, but it's finding companies of high quality that have a unique angle to bring to the market where, you know, it's not just the 10th, uh, you know, commercial EV player, um, but it really has kind of a different story to tell. Um, so I think the the the, the book the bear, you know, the bull case is bringing higher quality companies at attractive valuations that give investors a unique opportunity to invest and are consistent with the kind of market themes and and sector dynamics that they want to play. Um, you know, that inherently is going to draw in higher quality investors and and bring more stability to the market and, and have it kind of grow and play out. Um, you know, I think, you know, the bear cases, um, I think there are going to inevitably be over the course of 2022 SPACs that either, you know, don't make it, um, because they, you know, they kind of come to the end of their life cycle and are forced to liquidate without finding a deal or, you know, forced through transactions with companies that aren't, you know, that don't fit that profile of high quality management teams and business models, um, with a unique story to tell at an attractive valuation and, you know, you, you kind of create this cycle where SPAC sponsors push deals through to get, you know, to get them done and keep their, you know, keep their founders capital alive um, without bringing quality companies to the market, which, you know, would perpetuate some of the choppiness and concerns you've seen from those large family funds around participation, you know, in, in deals in this market. And what kind of volume do you project going forward? The, the SPAC market was doing $10 billion a year a couple of years ago. Uh, to eighty billion dollars in roughly in, in twenty twenty and one hundred and you know fifty plus billion in twenty twenty two, you know it feel, it feels like and a large chunk of that just in the first quarter, you know it feels like the the level of issuance we saw in the first quarter clearly was not going to be sustainable on, on a long term basis, um, but what you saw after the first quarter when the market you know pulled back, there was um, you know a, a a slow recovery in issuance over the course of the summer that accelerated into the fall and then really peaked into the fourth quarter and yet over thirty billion dollars of issuance in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, so we we think it's going to continue to be a very robust market uh, with significant new capital raising, um, but we think that it's going to be um, there's going to be more differentiation and more kind of haves and have nots in terms of the sponsors who have built or are building a, a good track record of bring, bringing quality companies to the market that are performing um, are going to continue to see investor capital rotate in. Um, and, you know, sponsors that have either not been able to deliver on transactions or have had a much more challenged track record are going to find it harder to bring deals to the market. Um, you know, there are 600 or so SPACs out there looking for acquisitions right now with over $150 billion of, of capital and trust, that's probably more than there should be. Um, but, you know, we certainly expect issuance and the market to be at, at significantly elevated levels to where it was, you know, two to five years ago. If sponsors are going to be pushing through transactions, uh, just it's sort of regardless, what's the most effective method that uh, to, to deal with uh, filtering that out? I think at the end of the day, the market kind of speaks with with their with their uh, with their money, right? And I think what you'll find is the transactions that investors don't believe in. Um, you'll see high redemption levels where you know investors take their capital out of the deal, um, and you'll see stocks that meaningfully underperform. And you know there will probably be some orphan securities out there for companies that either you know perhaps shouldn't have done a SPAC transaction. Um, or where they couldn't get that public market investor support. Um, and, you know, I think there's an element of the stacks that are already out there are going to have to find, um, you know, targets for their capital on a go forward basis. The, you know, there's a little bit of more of the element of raising capital um, for sponsors and, and, and having real conviction behind the ability to go out and, and find opportunities 
within a target market. And that means, you know, doing more homework ahead of the IPO to ensure that, you know, you have a real opportunity set in front of you of potential targets to go after and that you're going to be able to execute on your, on your plan post IPO. And uh, so how can viewers get in touch with you? Um, well, I mean, obviously, you know, happy, happy to have anyone who's, who's listening to this reach out to, you know, Brian or myself at, at, uh, at BMO. Um, we do also put out a weekly um, report to our clients. that talks about, you know, what's happening in the SPAC market. And, and if you reach out, we're happy to add you to that distribution as well. Well, thank you both for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Daniel.